So we are thrilled today to have Vivian Franco Diaz presenting. She is one of our Carla Fellows this year, and she is also a PhD candidate in Hispanic linguistics um, at the University of Minnesota. Um, she's going to be talking to you today about the impact of task complexity and language proficiency on the written production of second generation Spanish heritage speakers. So Vivian, thank you so much for being here. I'll just turn things over to you. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with the nature of this study. Um, this is a pilot study that I carry out in order to improve the study design of my dissertation study and also to investigate the feasibility of the tasks and procedures and find out if there is a potential effectiveness of this intervention. intervention. And so why uh, should we research about this topic, tax complexity and proficiency? Um, the main reason uh, and that I decided to research on this topic is because much of second language research uses tax to obtain evidence of a speaker's language use, but are we actually considering how tax characteristics and in, in its, uh, its implementation can affect a speaker's linguistic performance? So I believe that with this research, we can shed light on reasons why speakers use a specific language language resources and also uh, shed light on pedagogical processes that can promote language learning. So previous studies on tax complexity are um, basically based or focus on performance of L2 English speakers and uh, most of them partially confirm the Robinson uh, cognition hypothesis, which is the hypothesis that underlines the uh, framework by Robinson in terms of the design of tax. And this hypothesis um, predicts that increasing the cognitive load in tax of resource directing variables, which means cognitive and conceptual tax, contributes to a greater precision and complexity at the expense of fluency than when the tax is simple. And uh, for example, uh, we have some re uh, studies, uh, Salami and Dada's core, um, who uses um, who use uh, decision making right, uh, written tasks uh, through the variable of reasoning demands, and they find that um, in the complex tax, their learners uh, had more complexity and more fluency, but not difference in accuracy. So. Uh, this uh, study partially confirm uh, this hypothesis as fluency is supposed not to be um, greater in the complex tax. And um, the study by Xin, who uh, implement argumentative essays through using uh, reasoning demands as well, finds that actually um, learners perform better in the simple tax for most of the um, have uh, parameters um, except for lexical variation in which the complex tags um, lead to a greater performance. Um, in the study by Torres, uh, who used a tax of description of character's intention, also finds a similar result um, as, G as Shin in which um, learners had a greater performance in the simple tax in terms of accuracy for the oral tax, but not difference in the written task. So as you can see, um, there are mixed results in terms of confirming this hypothesis. And most of these studies uh, conclude that increasing tax complexity creates a trade-off between form and meaning. There are also some studies that integrate tax um, in terms of resource directing and resource uh, dispersing. Resource dispersing meaning performative or pr procedural demands variables. And um, for example, Levinka and Gilavert, who use uh, planning and elements, must be uh, more or less planning, more or less elements in an oral decision-making task, they find that increasing the number of elements could uh, positively impact the lexical complexity uh, independent, independently of the task being planned or unplanned. 
and um, opposed to this is in fluency where um, planning has more effects in planning, rather they increase or not the number of elements. And Talevi, um, oh, and they didn't find any difference in terms of their performance in syntactic complexity and accuracy. The study by Talevi, who also used planning and fewer more elements, uh, find that planning complex tasks would um, have greater accuracy in their performance and the planning simple tasks less accuracy. So uh, Robinson's cognition hypothesis uh, states that there are likely to be synergetic effects on a speech when tasks are made complex along both resource directing and resource dispersing simultaneously. However, this is not is this is not very clear in this hypothesis how this would look like. And there is very few studies that um, use both simultaneously, both uh, kinds of dimensions. So um, these studies, um, most of the times we conclude that theories still cannot explain some of the findings. So strengths and gaps of these previous studies. The strengths are the number of participants. Uh, most of them use 40 or more. Also, they randomly assign participants to different groups or conditions, depending if they are going to perform in the simple tasks or the complex tasks. And also, they discussed results uh, within the underlying hypothesis, the Robinson cognition hypothesis, even though there is not a general consensus among the studies. Some of the gaps of these studies are that most of them focus on <clears throat> L2 English speakers, and most don't control variables such as proficiency level. Um, they don't ask, uh, some of them don't ask uh, the participants about their perception of the complexity of the task. And very many vary greatly in the choice of CAF matrix, which makes difficult the comparisons between the studies or among the studies. And most of these studies are based on the oral mode and not the written production. So, uh, my purpose with this study was to expand this, um, this strand of research by incorporating, analyzing other type of learners, such as heritage learners, Spanish heritage learners, also analyzing their written performance and examining if their proficiency level has any uh, influence as well in, this, in their performance. So before the starting with um, methodology and results, I wanna explain, describe some of the key concepts that I use for this study. Uh, I define as being a Spanish heritage speaker as those individuals that belong to the group of the native speaker uh, of, the, of the language. Um, this is Biotegui, and also who have connection with the language. Uh, due to the family linguistic and also in certain cases cultural background and this is uh, following Carrera. Also um, Spanish heritage speakers have an understanding of the heritage language to different degrees depending on their linguistic experiences so some of them may be simultaneous bilinguals or sequential bilinguals. And also they are mostly active in relearning this language either by in, being enrolled in classes or intergenerational transmission, communicating with their family and friends. In terms of second generation Spanish heritage speakers, I define them as individuals that were born in the USA to at least one first generation Spanish speaking parent. This means these parents that immigrated to the US after 11 years of age. And if that's not the case, then uh, these individuals arrived in the US before six years of age. So this is a definition that I took into account from Silva Corbalan. For the recruitment, the participants uh, had to meet the following requirements. They had to be born in the USA or arrive in the US before they were six years old, um, being bilingual, Spanish and English, uh, have at least one parent who is from a Hispanic country, 
may or may not have taken Spanish classes and learned Spanish at home with parents, family, friends, etc. Uh, this pilot study uh, initially had 17 participants, but at the end only comprised 11 for the sample. And six of them were not included because one was from first generation. Another one, um, only one was from, uh, had a proficiency low, low proficiency level compared to the other ones who had intermediate and advanced level. And other four of them uh, perceive the simple tasks as the more complex. Um, the process of recruitment uh, was through communication with the Spanish instructors from my university in the Midwest, <clears throat> also through the Latino group that I am part of, um, also through friends and colleagues and flyers. For the instruments, um, I use a demographic questionnaire to find out about their um, information in terms of family background, age, etc. So I find um, the following information. My participants were between 18 to 24 years old. Uh, their Hispanic background was from North, Central, and South America. And at the moment of doing this study, uh, five of them were uh, registered in Spanish classes. <clears throat> uh, two of them arrived in the US before six years old. Nine of them were born in the USA. And in terms of general language use, uh, they manifested 44, 64% manifested um, mainly English use. In terms of um, their uh, proficiency, to obtain their proficiency level, I use the modified version of the daily exam by Montreal, which is an exam that has been um, also employed by a lot of studies, not only heritage for heritage speakers, but also for second language learners. And these uh, tests last 15 minutes and is over 50 points. And it's basically um, filling the blank vocabulary test and a closed passage. And um, from this test, I obtained that five of the participants were in the intermediate level, six of them were in the advanced level. Um, I also use the bilingual language profile, BLP, uh, to obtain their dominant language. And uh, this is a self-report survey, and they are asked about their language use, attitudes, and also skills. It lasts 10 minutes. And from this VLP, I obtained that they were more dominant in English. As far as of tax design, um, they had to complete two argumentative writing tasks. And it was the same task, just with different levels of complexity. One simple, one complex. And I manipulated the complexity uh, through the plus minus reasoning demands. Um, and I followed the triadic Componential Framework by Robinson, which I am going to show you. So this is the tri triadic Componential Framework by Robinson. And um, is basically three um, main categories. And I focus on tax complexity, cognitive factors, um, in the subcategory sub of resource directing variables, a causal reasoning um, a demands. So I use these, um, specifically these tasks because I wanted to facilitate the, um, the comparison of the results and also because um, my tasks were argumentative writing tasks. So I wanted them to develop this type of argumentation, especially uh, also because this type of test is uh, what is required in academic context. And also many of the language tests uses argumentative tasks uh, to evaluate language learners. Mm. 
So I also want to describe a little bit the Robinson's cognition hypothesis because this uh, framework is um, actually a taxonomy to, um, to develop or carry out in a practice manner this um, hypothesis. So the influences of this hypothesis are the multi, multiple attentional resources by weekends, also the output hypothesis by swine. And this hypothesis uh, predicts that in monologic tasks, um, a performance in complex tasks along resource directed dimensions, uh, it is expected or predicted that a performance will be more in accuracy and complexity, but not so much in fluency compared to the simple tasks. And when the participants perform complex tasks alone, resource dispersing dimensions, then the result would be the opposite. Less accuracy, less complexity, but greater fluency because the procedural um, tax demands could make them or lead them focus more not a, in the content or the, or the, of, the um, of the tax more than the linguistic code. Um, and they, um, Robinson hypothesized that there may be synergetic effects on production when we combine both resource directing and uh, resource dispersing dimensions simultaneously. Some of the predictions about uptake and interaction, uh, Robinson uh, predicts, or this hypothesis predicts that complex tasks uh, will lead to more interaction, more negotiation of meaning, and more attention to e input. And so, um, the heightened attention to input will therefore lead to greater depth of processing and lead to longer term reten retention of input, so memory and retention. Um, for automaticity, uh, this hypothesis predicts that the repetition involved in performing simple to complex sequences, tags, should lead to greater automat automaticity compared to when tasks are performed in the opposite order, complex and simple. Um, the hypothesis also uh, predicts less variation between, between learners when they are performing in the, sim in the simple tasks and greater variation in the learners when performing the more complex tasks. So the prompts for my grant. Oh. The prompts for my writing tags for the simple tags. I'm gonna read it to you. Uh, you are a travel agent trying to help a Spanish-speaking couple plan a honeymoon trip to the USA. They requested a recommendation based on the following criteria: cultural, tourist attractions, nice scenery, and cap camping or resorts. Respond to their email. Write a minimum of 150 words, identify your suggested location, and explain your rationale. Be sure to address how the suggested destination satisfies their three conditions. So you have 15 minutes to write and you can make up information when necessary. In comparison, the complex uh, tags, um, they will find that um, the couple uh, already went to this place that they suggested. And so they have to select another destination and make sure that they address the three conditions that the couple specified before, plus three new conditions that this couple added to the list, which are inexpensive, sporting events, and quality reasons. So now in the complex tags, they have six conditions, they have to write 300 words, and they have the same amount of time, 15 minutes. Um, these two tags were uh, carried out in one session, and they would start uh, first the simple, then the complex, and the timer only would start after they read the instructions and I responded their questions. Now for data analysis, uh, in terms of complexity, I used uh, five measures, three um, 
to describe the length of the T unit clause and noun phrase, one for uh, clausal subordination and another one for noun phrase complexity. So I use this uh, variety of measures because several studies have supported that researchers had to describe the language development of the learners, as we know by Holiday and Mathieson, that this um, development shows first an initial state of coordination, then subordination, and then in advanced level, we will see some more complex um, a language with nominalis nominalization and the use of noun, phrase noun phrases. <laughs> For accuracy, um, I took into account um, some concepts by Hosen and Norris and Ortega, who describe accuracy as acceptability and relevance uh, depending on social context and certain speech communities. I also consider uh, the idea of forward by literacy by Spicer Escalante, who talks about the possibility of transfer from a multidimensional perspective. That, me that means that it's possible that we can understand accuracy through the inclusion of multiplicity of uh, practices or accepting multiplicity of practices. So I use these um, definitions because of the unique population of heritage speakers who had diverse of experiences and also because of the language contact variety. So I describe or define in my study an error as the following, the deviation of the dialect variety in terms of the non-acceptance of an element in either of the two registers, formal or informal. And then <clears throat> I was not considering subjunctive, conditional, orthographic spelling aspects, lexical transfer from English. And this was because uh, not all of my participants had um, classes or um, formal classes of Spanish before. So I would also take into account their speech um, even though it reflected more of an oral register. So that's why I didn't include those aspects or classify them as errors as other um, more prescriptive studies would do. The formula for this accuracy uh, measure was number of error-free T, uh, error T units divided by the number of T units. Um, some of the morphosyntactic aspects that I consider in terms of morphology, for example, I consider gender, number, person, tense, uh, parts of the verb, and also some exceptions uh, if there were uh, some regional uses. Uh, for syntax, I considered word order, omission of words, and insertion of words, and also I um, I did some exceptions of for common accepted uses. For fluency, um, I examined the fluency uh, through participants' productivity, and this was uh, measured by counting the number of words per T unit, giving the same allocation of writing time for all participants. This was 15 minutes. Um, now, the overview of the results. So just to remember, my first question was, does tax complexity have an impact on the written production of Spanish heritage speakers? If so, how? So I'm gonna describe um, per level, for proficiency level. So for the intermediate, in terms of complexity, um, the simple tax, uh, had greater, um, they had greater performance in, in the complexity measures, um, except for the complex tax in mean length of noun phrase, which was greater in the complex tax. But in general, for complexity, they perform better in the simple tax for complexity. Uh, for accuracy, 
um, they had a greater accuracy in the complex tags. Fluency was the same, um, more fluency in the complex tags. Now for the advanced group, complexity, um, similar to the intermediate group, they perform better or had better complexity, greater complexity in the simple tags except for complex noun, noun phrases, which were uh, greater in the complex tags. For accuracy, um, they perform or had better accuracy in the complex tags and the same for fluency. So, um, summary of these uh, results of effects of tax complexity. So the complex tax uh, led to a greater complexity in terms of complex noun phrases, mean line of, mean line of noun, noun phrases, greater accuracy and greater fluency. While the simple tax also had a positive effect in the complexity especially for mean land of, of infinitive clause, mean land of P unit and dependent clauses, but less accurate speech uh, production and less fluent production. So um, there is a potential effectiveness of the results of this study since the cognition hypothesis can be partially confirmed. Um, now for the second question. Um, does the written production of Spanish heritage speakers differ according to the proficiency level? If so, how? So, uh, as we can see in this table, in terms of complexity, the uh, intermediate group outperform the advanced group in the complex tax. And then in the sim for the simple tax was the advanced group that outperformed the intermediate group. And there is an exception of um, having um, a similar or same performance in the complex tags for complex noun phrases. In terms of accuracy, uh, the advanced group outperformed the intermediate group in both simple and complex tags. Uh, for fluency, the intermediate group, uh, surprisingly, uh, outperformed the advanced group in both tags, having more words in their production. So the question, the big question, is this study feasible? Yes, but with some changes in study design, recruitment, and data analysis. So I'm gonna... Uh, describe or list some of the limitations and also how to improve. Um, the limitations of this study, well, because it was a pilot of study, so the number of participants, only 11, we cannot generalize or have strong conclusions. Um, so I, how to improve is to include more participants, at least 40 or more. Um, also, there can be possible carryover effects from simple tax performance to the complex because they uh, carry out their, their written tax in the same session, the, the simple, uh, the complex right after the simple. So how to improve is to randomly assign participants um, to different levels of tax complexity, and also do these uh, tags in different sessions uh, to have less amount of tags that they have to do because they have to do the test, the questionnaire, and um, all of that. Also, um, another limitation is that there, in, there needs to be a specified um, in the participant criteria, the type of bilinguals because there are some cases in which, for example, they learn um, a English first and then Spanish uh, 10 years later. And this is the case of uh, some times that um, they don't learn the language from their parents when they are children, but later they do that. Uh, so I would add to the, to the, to the criteria 
that they have uh, grew up speaking both Spanish and, or, and English, or grew up speaking first Spanish and later in life learned English. And also uh, that they have lived most of their lives in the USA. And these uh, I consider to add that because <clears throat> there are some cases, especially for these speakers that live uh, in Mexico and also in the border. So most sometimes their lives are mainly in, in Mexico. Their studies are basically or mainly in Spanish in Mexico. Uh, their families in Mexico, most of the contact is in Mexico. And then they come to the US and cross the border mostly for work. So um, I would more consider them as first generation speakers because of the greater contact of the language and more experience of living in, in the other side in Mexico. Um, also another limitation is how we can warranty the homogeneity, homogeneity of the audience. So um, I, I plan to incorporate a pre-writing task as part of the participation selection besides the, the, the daily exam and the BOP. Um, <clears throat> also add qualitative parameters, parameters to evaluate the written production. That's a limitation. So we um, should add more uh, qualitative parameters. So for example, I add an adequacy rubric uh, for pre-writing tasks and also other types of complexity um, descriptions such as types of phrases, types of clauses. Um, another uh, limitation is um, that I didn't add any integrated reliability in this pilot study. So for the dissertation, it would be uh, great uh, to incorporate different judges in data analysis besides me. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, the tags that I, I implemented are the authentic tags is actually the topic of interest of the participants and is it related to their daily uh, experiences or daily life. So um, <clears throat> for my dissertation, I designed tags that are more, that are somewhat too fully authentic. So they're more personal, they're related to their life, life experiences as bilinguals, as uh, individuals living uh, between two cultures and two languages. Um, <clears throat> and also another limitation is if we can actually consider simple and complex as a dichotomy. So in order to, to understand or go deep in this kind of statement is uh, to think of tasks as a continuum and design the tasks as, for example, simple, less simple, complex, and more complex. And this also would uh, resemble more um, real life world in which we know that something is not just simple and something is not just complex, but there is also a degree. Uh, some pedagogical implications of this study in terms of <clears throat> tax design. Um, tasks uh, cannot be too complex or too simple that impede the advancement of the speaker's language skills. And also uh, determining the degree of complexity uh, becomes problematic because this also depends on other variables such as the linguistic knowledge of the speakers and also their own experience with the modality of the task. So in this case of my participants, we know that uh, heritage speakers have more uh, fluency in terms of oral production and not in the written production. So it creates even a more complex uh, to the complexity of the tax being in the written mode. Um, tax should be authentic to increase participants' motivation, engagement, since these types of tax simulate more what happens in real world and their daily lives. And I also consider that we should incorporate in this type, oh, in these studies, um, authentic authentic tags 
um, because we can engage uh, our learners uh, to, um, to be more motivated and we also can engage um, educators in terms of appreciating our learners' language life experiences. And this is also part of the learning process. Um, previous research has indicated that heritage speakers have greater oral fluency compared to their writing skills. Therefore, applying a more holistic and dimensional, multidimensional examination to their accuracy in the written mode should be considered, um, especially at the first stages of academic writing. And also when we want to um, a, include uh, the writer uses of different linguistic resources as part of their identity. Um, for tax order, uh, previous research, research report mixed results about the effects of tax complexity on performance. So we need more consistent research in terms of measures, in terms of tax procedure, to actually be able to confirm these underlying hypotheses of this um, framework, tax design framework. So um, another uh, uh, pedagogical implication is that speakers um, can benefit from either tax depending on their proficiency level. So this type of research could probably inform teachers on what what sequence of tax is better depending on the CAF dimension that this specific proficiency level needs to improve. And um, these are the references. Thank you. If you have questions, comments, thank you so much for attending this presentation and from all over the world. Thank you, Vivian. We really appreciate this presentation and um, you sharing the results of your pilot study and kind of thinking it's interesting to hear you think about looking ahead toward the dissertation and what you're going to change. So we have several questions that have come up in the chat. Um, one of them is related to how you're using the term bilingual to talk about your participants. Mm -hmm. So the question is really about how are you, how are you able to, to say that the learners are bilingual if they maybe don't have a high level of proficiency. So can you talk a little bit about how you're using that term um, in relation to the heritage language speakers in your study? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, part of the study has a um, demographic questionnaire. So in that questionnaire, I asked several questions about when they started uh, to speak English, Spanish, uh, if that was from birth, or uh, what year they started uh, acquiring or learning the language. And as for the, the definition of heritage speakers, so they are bilinguals. They either grew up being bilingual since birth, or they first uh, learned Spanish and then later in life, uh, when they started the, the school in the U.S., they started learning English. So I obtained most of this information uh, from the background or the, the, the demographic questionnaire. And in terms of the proficiency uh, test, um, the, the participants would, um, would have to pass the test and have either intermediate or advanced level. And why? Because these writing tasks actually are demanding arguments, which is more um, able to do in these intermediate and advanced levels than when the speaker is in the low level. So there wouldn't be even a reasonable uh, point to study the low level within these argumentative tax because they actually ask for more demanding uh, argumentation, which is not what the uh, low level would uh, require them to do. Right, and if I'm understanding you correctly, Vivian, when we're, at least when we're talking about heritage language learners, 
the concept of bilingualism is defined maybe differently than we might define it traditionally for foreign language learners, because it's about a lot about the social context in which the language is learned and the family background related mm-hmm. to the language. Is that a correct sort yep. of summary? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So the next question is from Kayane, and I apologize if I'm not saying your name correctly. Um, and this is a question about the two tasks that you gave to, to your participants in the study. So the question is, what are the differences between the two tasks in terms of complexity? Are the number of words and conditions enough to consider them, one of them to be more complex than the other? Mm-hmm. That's a great question because um, it's very problematic to consider or to establish what is complex enough and what is simple enough. And I think that this is one of the um, disadvantages of using this type of framework because it's still very polemic what is simple enough and what is uh, complex enough. So in terms of my tax, uh, what I used was to add the number of uh, elements, so more reasoning demands. In the first tax, they had uh, two, and then in the second, which is the complex, they had six, and they had to write more words. So some of the perceptions that I obtained from my participants about the complexity of the tax was because uh, they had to have more elements and they had to write more words. So would that have perhaps influenced the findings since one task was requiring them to write more words than another? Is that going to, did that impact the way that you um, calculated your results? Like, how did you, how did you overcome? Like, well, I, let me, I'll just let you answer the question. Yeah, if it makes sense. What was the question? Sorry. You're talking about complexity in terms of number or fluency Mm -hmm. in terms of number of words. How are you able to distinguish between the two tasks to decide whether learners had had produced more fluent writing in one versus the other if there were a larger word requirement for one task than the other? Yeah, uh, for this study, I didn't do any statistical um, any statistical test. It was just analyzing their means. So I would just analyze uh, how many words they would write uh, depending on the time that it was given for all of the participants. So yeah, I didn't, because this is a pilot study, it was just more descriptive. So Mm -hmm. it was just description of means, but I didn't do like, if that was statistically significant between the groups or between the tasks. Okay, so there's a couple of questions from Azran about metacognition. Um, So um, they're asking you, so you focused on the cognitive aspects of writing in your analysis today. And so Azran is wondering if you could talk about metacognition instruction among learners and metacognitive strategy use while performing either writing, um, they're talking about listening tasks, but I don't think you've been focusing on listening. Can you say anything at all about metacognition in relation to writing and your study? Um, Well, so in my study, I didn't do, for example, uh, a practice of, for example, grammar or writing argumentative essays. But for example, some other studies, what they have done is, for example, have some instruction in a specific grammar aspect that they want them to to apply in the task. And then um, that can have an effect on their results because they are actually already um, taught on this before. Uh, But in my side, I, I, probably their metacognitive strategies or resources is actually the language that they already possess and also the experience that they already have with the written mode, uh, which most of them, they don't have experience unless they have taken classes of, uh, formal classes of Spanish. But <clears throat> I, get, I, I think that these strategies, metacognitive strategies can be used um, when there is explicit instruction of a type of text or a certain aspect of the grammar. 
and then we can see if this um, specific instruction had an effect on the different types, types of tags. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the next question is from Mandy um, and she asks, I love the idea of a task <coughs> complexity continuum could you talk about how you would operationalize that? Yeah, um, so there is a study by Levinka, which I really like because she considered this continuum of, um, of the complexity of the tax. So what I am doing is following um, her procedure, which is having a simple task, which is, for example, more planning. So they add more planning. So it's a combination of the, the direct research um, variable and the direct uh, and the research dispersing variable. So adding planning to the to the tax. So more elements with more planning, uh, less elements with more planning, more elements with planning. So creating the continuum of simple, less simple, complex, and more complex. So it's like cr creating a, almost like a grid mm -hmm. where you would have, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. see where they, where they fall within that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's um, like adding, adding more uh, planning or not planning. Mm -hmm. So there's a follow-up question from Oranya who had been asking the questions about <laughs> um, bilingualism and proficiency, the definition of bilingualism and proficiency. And Oranya, I'm not sure if this is a follow-up to that question related to proficiency and the definition of bilingual. Um, they're asking about grammar structures and advanced vocabulary. Um, so Oranya, I, are you able to unmute yourself? Maybe you might wanna ask this question orally. I'm, I'm having a hard time mediating this question the way that it's written. Hello there. Hi. Nice presentation. Thank uh, you for attending. Thank you for the chance. I was asking about uh, mm -hmm. the participants that mm -hmm. were in a way bilingual, mm -hmm. but not in the sense that bilingualism is concepted. So mm -hmm. you took into consideration um, the structures and the vocabulary used to whether they were advanced or intermediate levels in your tasks? Mm -hmm. Were they affiliated with the idea of the tasks before taking the tests? No, it was actually a task that they did like on the spot. They were not uh, shown these tasks before or they didn't perform these types of tasks before or an, an, a similar experiment with me before. And in terms of vocabulary, I don't analyze their lexical complexity or lexical variety. I mostly uh, analyze um, other aspects of complexity. Um, I see. So uh, your results were coming out from just engaging in the tasks? Yep, mm -hmm. just engaging and on the tasks. The language you could produce. And yep, that's correct. The level of the language, even mm -hmm. though they were bilingual in a sense. Um, <clears throat> they self-identify as bilingual because they either grew up being bilingual speaking both languages and um, so I like they 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 I use that as part of what they uh, self-report as being bilingual. So know, um, you may <laughs> I may stop there. Um, do you think that if they your candidates were more familiar with the tasks mm -hmm. would perform better? Um, so if we take into account the cognition hypothesis, so there is a part of automaticity. So doing tasks repeatedly would actually uh, lead to a better performance because they are already used to a certain type of tags, a uh, certain type of text, um, 
a certain type of tax design. So in a way, repeating these tax in the future would lead to a uh, better improvement if we follow this cognition hypothesis. Yes, that would do in a, in a, in a class for foreign language learning prospects. But does this affect the SL students as well? Sorry, I, I, I didn't understand that last question, sorry. Now, in Greece, we teach mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. um, according to the European framework. Yes. Uh, specific modes to work on. Text, mm -hmm. horse books, critical thinking, uh, mm -hmm. gap filling, sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they get used to the idea of doing this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Role playing, yeah. acting, talking. Mm -hmm listening on all of that mm -hmm. when you are a bilingual you have the chance to um, talk at home mm -hmm. as a foreign language student you don't oh yeah Our yeah doesn't know english yeah <clears throat> that's when that's i couldn't ask her a thing not the simple question uh-huh yeah that so that right. Uh -huh. that's, that's a great, great example because, for example, uh, learners of the language as a foreign language, not as a second language, who have more limited interaction with the language. And so that's why it is so important to have authentic tags that resemble the real world of, for example, this Spanish speaking world or in your context, English um, as a foreign language, so they can have more familiar content of what is actually uh, or how this English context would look like in real life if they had that interaction. And so when performing these types of tags, we need to consider what is their proficiency level because of course we cannot just uh, create these tags that are so difficult or so easy that can uh, like negate the improvement or show what they actually can uh, do in the task. So that's why it's so important to consider the level of proficiency because that way we can design the tasks uh, and see if this uh, level, uh, this person can develop the task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a way they had to use their prior knowledge mm -hmm. So they could get engaged into the tasks and whatever they had to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Prior, pri prior uh, knowledge not plus prior knowledge, not exactly knowing and learning factors. Um, factor. as in working in, in a school. Ah, uh, okay. In a class. Mm -hmm. They were not used to the idea of uh, having to do with uh, writing activities. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Yeah. But listening tasks would mm -hmm. be more easily interacted to them as they use the language at home. Mm -hmm. One of the two parents may be Spanish. Maybe yeah. Spanish. So... Why would, I don't know, it gets me confused. How can they, there be so much gap mm -hmm. in the level? Um, of I, wonder, I wonder if maybe we can uh, ask this question, Oranya, after we finish the session, because um, it sounds like maybe this would be a good conversation between the two of you. Um, and we do have... Yeah, um, thank you for the questions. We do have one more question that I think is important to get to from Tomas. So Orane, if you want to stay on afterwards, maybe Vivian can give you her email and the two of you can um, interact that way. But there was a question from Tomas who asked, uh, what psycholinguistic processes might be at play when learners perform a more complex task? How is a more complex task conducive to language acquisition? Mm -hmm. So um, if we follow uh, this framework and this hypothesis, um, it is expected that 
increasing the complexity of the tax will increase the cognitive uh, aspects of their language or processing. And so it will lead to um, more, um, um, more complex production of language. And therefore, um, in terms of psycholinguistic processing, um, data attention resources uh, will get focused on certain parameters. In this case, this theory and this hypothesis um, considers that these um, learners are able to uh, focus their attention on, on more than one resource. And so that uh, is the reason why complexity would also lead not only to just improve one of the parameters, but also simultaneously um, others. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Vivian. I appreciate um, your all of your answers to the many questions that there were about your presentation. There was obviously great interest among our attendees. We are coming up on the end of the hour and we wanna be respectful of people's time. So um, I just, I wanna thank Vivian for um, this wonderful presentation. And I wanna thank all of you for coming today and for choosing to attend a Carla talk. I say this at the end of every talk, but we know you have a choice about where you're spending your time on Zoom. And we really appreciate that you're spending it with us. And we hope that we'll see you at another Carla talk uh, later on this semester. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye.